Thank you, Noga. So ample opportunities for uh, collaboration in different uh, research uh, uh, projects. Uh, regional uh, cooperation is certainly uh, related to the uh, humanities, but now we move to the so-called hard core of the humanities with uh, Professor uh, Noah Mizrahi, who is the acting uh, chair of the Department of uh, Biblical Studies at uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, his studies seek to uh, illuminate the interconnection between uh, textual uh, criticism, historical linguistics, and the uh, editorial history, if you would like, of uh, biblical and post-biblical a literature with a special attention to the Dead Sea Scores. So he was invited here, A, because his research has to do with the Dead Sea Scores right here, but also because his research is characterized by a cross-disciplinarity, and this is precisely uh, the topic he's going to uh, present now. Uh, uh, Noam is currently working on a new book uh, project which presents uh, uh, an addition and commentary of one of the most important scores found in uh, Qumran, Pesher Habakkuk, which represents a special form of sectarian uh, commentary of biblical uh, prophecy. So, Noam, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you also for the invitation. And special thanks to Mira, who had to endure many uh, <laughs> problems that I caused her in the last uh, few, a couple of weeks. Um, I actually adapted a little bit the title of my talk uh, because I thought that in this uh, context it might be uh, useful to give you an overview, a panoramic overview of the uh, various projects uh, related, of some of the various projects uh, related to Dead Sea Scrolls research, which are being held at the moment at Tel Aviv University. It is actually... Okay. Tech, tech uh, crisis. Uh, this is actually a very uh, exciting uh, moment uh, uh, in, in Dead Sea Scrolls research uh, in the context. Uh, this is also an exciting moment, but not the one I, I meant. Um, because actually Tel Aviv University is at the forefront uh, of several collaborative ventures, uh, the like of which has never been uh, tried before. But before I uh, embark to the... Uh, uh, this venture, can okay, Marishon, Marishon. Yes, the view, full view, remote. The matter, can. Yeah, done. Okay. Yes, yes. We take the mortgage. We enslave our children. Whatever. Okay. Now we do. Okay. So I begin with a very, very brief uh, introduction to what are the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, everyone know, uh, uh, knows what, uh, what is the Dead Sea, but what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Uh, I guess the term has been uh, heard before, uh, um, but I would like to break it down to three uh, aspects. First, what are the scrolls? The scrolls are basically manuscripts, or rather the remains of manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, from 2,000 years ago. And uh, we call them scrolls because they, in the book uh, technology of the period, of the Greco-Roman period, the Hellenistic Roman period, uh, books were not uh, created by attaching pages one on top uh, on the other, but rather by, uh, not by binding, that is, but rather by attaching them one next to the other, sewing them, uh, getting a roll of parchment. And we get different uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, scrolls in the uh, actual evidence. Uh, what you see on the left, which looks horrible, is actually one of the finest examples, one of the best preserved scrolls that we have. We don't have many of these. We have about 10 of these. Uh, what you see in the middle is a, a, this, almost the sole remain of, from a scroll of uh, the book of Psalms, the biblical book of Psalms. And this is also relatively good in our terms, in our terminology. It looks wonderful. Uh, and what you see on the right-hand side is the more typical uh, form in which we get our scrolls, that is, we get them as scroll fragments. And this is going to be, as you will see immediately, the main challenge that we deal with. Uh, but of course, uh, I took a very extreme, uh, uh, apropos extremity, I took a very extreme uh, uh, photo. We also have uh, most of the scrolls that we have come in fragments in bigger sizes, but uh, all of them are, almost all of them are fragmentary. 
The time frame that we speak about is the Second Temple period or the Greco-Roman period. This is a period of which, in which the uh, Jewish society of, uh, of the time was uh, divided between different uh, uh, um, what the uh, historians of the period call philosophies, which is a very nice word to say uh, sects, really. This is a highly sectarian uh, um, society. And one of these sects is the a sect that inhabited the site of Qumran, uh, yes, which is found here. Uh, we are here, just, oh, we are down here. Uh, and uh, at the uh, site, near the site of, the site of Qumran uh, uh, was the place in which a, a certain sect called the Essenes, probably the Essenes, this is a, a bit debated, uh, uh, had lived. Uh, and in the caves surrounding this site, many, many scroll fragments were found. Uh, normally, when people say the Dead Sea Scrolls, so scrolls were found in various sites in the Judean desert along the seashore. But actually, when people say Dead Sea Scrolls, they usually uh, mean only to the Qumran Scrolls. Most of the examples that I will give will also be uh, from uh, Qumran, but Masada also has its share, of course, of scrolls. Hopefully, there will be more in due time. Uh, but this is uh, not uh, uh, in my hands. However, it is important to say that some of the scrolls that we have in these sites are somehow interconnected, although the, in the intercon nature of the interconnection is uh, still a, a mystery that needs to be solved. The most uh, uh, important, perhaps, connection is that we have two copies, two different copies of the same work, of the same literary work called the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, uh, which is very important and dear to me because I'm writing a new commentary on that as well. But uh, uh, so one copy, uh, several copies were found in Qumran in different caves, and one copy uh, it was found in Masada. And this is again a beautiful uh, 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 fragment, but this is all that is left of that fragment. So there is a connection, but I will focus mostly on the uh, Qumran uh, fragments. Uh, why uh, you will often hear the, the saying that the Dead Sea Scrolls is one of the most important archaeological discoveries uh, ever made, uh, and there are many reasons to say that. Uh, marketing is one of them, but not the only one. Um, the reason is that we're speaking about a really crucial period in the history of both Judaism and Christianity. This is the formative era in the history of Judaism. Uh, Judaism, as we know it, uh, establishes its main uh, uh, social and religious uh, uh, institutions in this period. Nascent Christianity evolves in the first century uh, uh, CE from the Judaism of that period. And actually, and many of its distinctive ideas are actually rooted in the literature of this period. And this importance can be demonstrated with a, big, uh, a good number of scrolls. I chose just one which again is, uh, I have a personal connection to this particular one. This is all that is left from a work, a literary work, that was probably written in the second century BC, uh, which mentioned, which was uh, the cause of many, many uh, um, debates in scholarship. Some of you may have heard the speculation, which was uh, especially popular in the 90s, that the Dead Sea Scrolls at the time were not yet fully published, even though they were discovered 70 years ago, already in the 40s. And uh, one of the rumors was that uh, there it, is, it was due to a conspiracy by the Vatican. And uh, actually, all this conspiracy theory rests upon this particular scroll, because this scroll mentions, uh, in the first line of this column, it mentions a figure called the Son of God. It says, el itamar uvar the Son of God, he will be named, the Son of the Most High, he shall be known as the son of Most High. And this was very, very crucial uh, uh, because this is actually the first Jewish work that we have which mentions a figure known as the Son of God. And mind you, the Son of God was a title that we thought was reserved to Jesus Christ uh, at least 150 years, if not two, two centuries before this, uh, after this text uh, was uh, written. So there was this whole uh, conspiracy theory that the Vatican was trying to hide this uh, document, which is, of course was uh, uh, wrong because this, the, the reason why this text was not published is because it was written in Aramaic. And all the Aramaic documents were left as leftovers to the final end because they didn't know what to do with them. 
Uh, and there were a couple of other minor reasons, but this is the main one. So uh, now we know that the uh, notion of the Son of God, uh, uh, divine, uh, the, the idea that uh, a human can uh, uh, appropriate for himself a divine uh, figures, if, uh, divine attributes, is actually not an invention of Christianity, uh, but rather it, was, it is rooted in the uh, Jewish apocalyptic literature of that period, which again sheds new light on the history of Christianity, I can speak an hour about that, but we don't have time. We have to rush uh, to the next uh, slide. Uh, the next slide is actually, uh, the next couple of slides will show you some of the problems, the practical problems that we have to deal with when we try to learn the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the most obvious uh, uh, um, um, problem I already mentioned. When we say scrolls, we normally think about, you know, continuous texts. That's, however, the one thing that we don't normally get. What we get is a huge pile of uh, fragments. Uh, to be exact, there are about 25,000 fragments found in the area of Qumran. And uh, it took us uh, 70 years to, uh, to reach to the interim <laughs> conclusion that they uh, should be sorted to something like 1,000 uh, different manuscripts. But this is like a huge jigsaw puzzle of which an unknown number of parts are missing, an unknown uh, a number of parts are completely distorted and uh, uh, convoluted, and uh, we uh, in many, many cases have to, uh, uh, to admit that we're not sure how to proceed. But uh, sorting these fragments is, a cr is really crucial because without identifying different fragments of the same manuscript, we can't know what this manuscript actually says. We can say a lot of important things about the history of Judaism, of Christianity, of, of the land of Israel in the Greco-Roman period, but it really all boils down to our ability to reconstruct a whole manuscript out of these scattered fragments. And this task really took decades to uh, complete. What you see here uh, you see one of the scholars of the original team that was uh, assigned uh, to do this job, and this uh, picture was taken at the Rockefeller Museum in East Jerusalem at the time uh, in the hands of the Jordanian government, and you see how they work. They basically uh, uh, put all the fragments on these glass, glass plates and uh, individually tried to identify which one is related to each one, based on color of the skin, on, uh, especially on handwriting, etc. Uh, there were seven and later 11 such scholars, but I, mind, I, mean, I have to remind you, it's 25,000 fragments. So it's a life sentence for many, many years of work. And here you see again one of the scholars, this is John Marco Allegro, trying to match some of the fragments. Now we know that about 90% of his job is worthless because he just couldn't read, uh, couldn't join the fragments uh, correctly. So what we are trying to do, and here I move to uh, the collaborative projects that we have. And Mira, feel free to stop me whenever I reach my time limit. Uh, and I, I'll do that. Okay. Um, so he, I, I, again, I, I, I offer a, a broad spectrum, but not broad enough because these are I'm only showing two and three perhaps uh, projects uh, uh, that are currently running. Um, and all of them uh, are, uh, almost all of them are collaborative and uh, because we, I think, reached to the point in which we realize that uh, the way we did the humanities so far cannot be the same way in which we conduct them from now on. Uh, the task is simply too huge and th there are really new methods that we can uh, use for in mutual benefit. So one uh, collaborative project is being conducted with uh, Professor Nachum Dershowitz and Professor Lior Wolf me, from the Computer Science uh, S uh, School for Computer Science, Blavatnik School for Computer Science. And this is part of a larger consortium of projects which is conducted in cooperation with all the institutions that you see uh, above and gets uh, uh, German uh, funding uh, from the DEEP project which is by the uh, DFG. What we are trying to do there, basically, and this is just you know, a hint to what, we're, uh, uh, what they are really trying to do. I'm, I often tell them what I want to have, but really the real job of programming is done uh, there. They basically try to apply uh, technologies of facial recognition to the identification, sorting, and classification of these fragments. So basically they measure all kinds of visual properties 
that we can extract from images, from digital images, excellent new digital images of the scrolls, and to uh, uh, allow with the use of deep learning technology actually to uh, uh, teach the computer how to identify different fragments, fragments that might look now completely different, for instance, in terms of the color of the parchment, but, uh, and this might be because the, all these fragments were in the caves and were exposed to different uh, 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 climate uh, conditions, etc. but still they might come from the same manuscript. However, as you already see from this uh, particular image, which is a manuscript found not in Qumran, but rather in Masada, this is a Ben Sira scroll from Masada, uh, what, again, there, this is not an easy task, <laughs> uh, because what you see here, and you will see even uh, better here, is that many of these fragments are very, uh, almost hopelessly distorted. This is not hopelessly distorted, this is actually quite legible. Uh, I, I spared you the, uh, the more cruel uh, images, uh, but you see here that the, because all these fragments are written on parchment, uh, and parchment is an organic material which easily uh, interacts with its uh, uh, with con environmental conditions, it changes completely. So actually it's not so easy to teach the computer that these lines were once uh, straight, that the uh, spaces between them were once regular, and uh, that these uh, 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 tiny uh, letters that we see here are the same as the bigger letters that we have here. And even, it even boils down to a more, uh, uh, it sounds trivial, but actually it's not so trivial at all, that we have to teach the computer to differentiate between the black color of the background and the black color of the script so that it will uh, be able to conduct certain searches. So actually, as it often happens, this is at least my experience, uh, we begin in this collaborative research with a very clear idea of what we would like to get, and then we discover that in many cases we just ask the wrong questions. We have to reformulate our questions and to realize that a whole new uh, path of uh, development is uh, ahead of us. Um, another problem is that uh, many of the first scholars who dealt with the, uh, um, uh, with the fragments who have done really a, a marvelous job, especially if we take into account the really uh, almost primitive tools that they had in, at their disposal. They, these guys worked with a dictionary, with nails, with, uh, uh, with, sorry, with scissors, uh, and with, this was the worst part, with scotch tape. So uh, in the 50s, when these uh, fragments were first uh, uh, brought to the museum, uh, they were discovered in 1947, actually in November 1947 was the first uh, scroll was known. And they thought that the scotch tape, in the f in, when they uh, began to sort these fragments in the 50s, they thought that uh, joining them by scotch tape would be a great idea because it's, you know, it's transparent, etc., etc. Little did they know that the, uh, the glue of the uh, scotch tape uh, would prove a, a, a disaster when it interacts with the uh, parchment. And actually what the Israel Antiquities Authorities is investing in the last more than 20 years now, there is a whole uh, uh, group of conservators peeling away this scotch tape and trying to repair some of the damage. And we have to remember this is not the damage done in purpose. This is the damage because they thought, they just thought that they're doing the best thing for these manuscripts, but of course they were wrong. And the uh, principle now is just don't do anything that you can't reverse uh, unless you really uh, have to. But one of the results is that, especially with highly damaged manuscripts such as this one, which is a manuscript of canticles, I didn't say that but because I'm rushing uh, <laughs> ahead, but uh, uh, among these 1,000 scrolls, about 25% are copies of biblical books, books from the Hebrew Bible, as we know it. These are the old, oldest manuscripts of the Bible that uh, we have, and the importance of that aspect I will say uh, in a minute. So this is a highly uh, uh, damaged fragment of, uh, um, can of canticles from Qumran, but actually it's not one fragment. It's a, co it's a composite of many, many smaller fragments. And if you look closely enough, you will see that the uh, join of this fragment is wrong. Uh, here, uh, for instance, here you can see that the letters do join more or less nicely. But here, this uh, fragment over, I mean, it covers another fragment. Here it's even worse. Here there is a letter which goes below the surface of the other fragment. And it, it's now clear that all these fragments were joined uh, um, wrongly. 
they were glued together in such a way that it's impossible to remove it. And we also have to, if we do uh, that computer thing, we still have to find a way to tell the computer to uh, cut that, and we don't want to do that for 25,000 fragments, right? We have to do that some way uh, automatically. So many, many uh, really intriguing challenges are ahead of us, but I'm actually very optimistic because that uh, um, research group has done really marvelous things for other, another corpus of uh, fragments from antiquity and late antiquity and early Middle Ages, and this is from the Cairo Geniza. These guys have developed, and the, here we talk about a much larger corpus of more than 250,000 uh, fragments, but, but well, <laughs> this is a crucial point, in a much better shape. So uh, we still have a lot of work, but uh, we're progressing. And this, uh, uh, but this is also a very exciting thing because we, again, we discover new questions that we can ask and perhaps hopefully implement uh, with other corpora later on. Another uh, thing that I'm pushing forward, I'm trying to at least to push forward uh, now is to implement, also did to find a, a digital means to uh, implement uh, techniques of reconstruction of scrolls, not just to identify fragments and to sort them, but also to reconstruct them. And here we, um, what we will be trying to do is uh, to, f to write an algorithm that would imitate a, a method devised in the 60s by this nice German guy, Hartmut Stegemann, who worked in Göttingen, uh, and who uh, in the 60s paid attention to something that somehow uh, uh, um, skipped the attention of many other scrolls. And uh, you remember that these scrolls were originally rolled. They were rolled. They were kept rolled, some of them at least, and if so, the pattern of the damage exhibits some sort of regularity. So basically what you see here, you see that the, for instance, the distance between uh, the damage points is either increasing or decreasing in the direction of the rolling. Uh, here it's even better, this is a highly damaged scroll. But what the, the ingenuity of Stegemann's method is that he said, okay, we're all sorry that all these manuscripts are damaged, but we can perhaps use the damage in order to reconstruct the scroll. This is important because these scroll, again, are nicely preserved, I mean, for us. But if we have only scattered fragments and we, di we, di we uh, discern the contours of the damage and we can see that the distances are either decreasing or increasing, we can actually find a way to place them in the right outline, at least, of the manuscript, and we're trying to develop something in this direction. Okay, I'm moving to a very different, uh, 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 different but similar in some respects, uh, collaborative project, um, um, which uh, entails uh, uh, cooperation not with computer sciences, but rather with biology, particularly with genetics, and my partner there is Dr. Oded Rechavi, um, and there are other uh, partners to this project as well, I have to say. Uh, also from the zoology, we had a great, uh, uh, and we had wonderful consultations with Dorote Hukon from zoology, but, uh, I think, right, zoology. Um, but uh, Oded is really the leading partner. The story, if I have two seconds to, yeah, okay. Uh, it's a wonderful story, so I really have to share it with him, uh, with you. Uh, um, the Tel Aviv University has a tradition uh, that uh, uh, new uh, faculty members are taken to uh, uh, Caesarea uh, for a couple of days. We don't see much of Caesarea, to be honest. Um, we learn about the uh, administrative structure of the university, but we do get some activity, and Oded and I, we didn't know each other. We happened to sit next to each other at the bus to Caesarea, so we were introducing each other, and I asked Oded what, he's, he, what is the topic of his research. He told me worms, worms. He particularly works on C. elegans, if it means something to you. And I told him, okay, so there is something in common between us because I work on what the worms left us. And this is, by the way, true. We, I mean, I didn't show it to you, but there, there are many wormholes in these manuscripts. So uh, we thought that this was the end of the conversation, but uh, little did we know. Uh, we very quickly already, by the way, at that week, we thought, okay, perhaps we can push this uh, forward. And I'm really grateful to the uh, administration of the Tel Aviv University that allowed it, uh, this uh, opportunity. And I also have to say that much of the uh, progress that we achieved in the last years was uh, thanks to the really uh, close attention of the president, you know, Professor Yossi Klafter, who uh, uh, accompanied this project with much interest, and we acknowledge that gratefully. However, there is a spoiler alert here. 
that um, everything that I say from this point on is not for publication, okay? And uh, <laughs> as I said, this uh, message will self-destruct in five seconds, uh, also because I need to finish quickly, as quickly as possible. But uh, basically what we're trying to do uh, here, uh, we're trying, we're basically sampling the fragments of the Dead uh, Sea Scrolls. And our goal, eventual goal, is to create a kind of a, a genetic uh, profile, not to say a DNA ID, for every individual fragment so that ideally we can uh, ascertain the match or mismatch of every fragment with every other fragment. This is the, the, the final goal. However, again, as we progressed, we realized that uh, uh, sometimes we ask the wrong questions and new questions have to be uh, asked because we realized that uh, the task is much more complicated for several reasons because some scrolls are very long and were com uh, consist of different sheets, at, th at least theoretically made of different animals. So uh, the mismatch, the genetic mismatch need not uh, imply that they belong to different scrolls. Uh, it goes the other way around as well. Uh, so this is really going to be a collaborative research because we have to use several very different techniques of reconstruction and uh, analysis in order to reach a certain uh, conclusion. However, we did reach already some interim uh, really, really, really as, as my biologist partners say, really cool stuff, uh, really cool uh, results, uh, um, which I cannot expose at this moment because <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, because uh, we're in the final stages, I hope, of uh, preparing this uh, paper for print, and I was uh, uh, sworn not to reveal any uh, <laughs> silence. <laughs> Um, so, I, I, but uh, this is really part of a bigger picture. I want to, would like to understand this is part, I think, I mean, I'm not an objective uh, 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 reporter for that, but I really think that we move, at least in our own research, we move to a different phase completely of study of these fragments. None, none of these techniques has been uh, tried before, uh, and none of these kind of cooperations have been tried before. And I think that uh, within five years or so, we will find that the uh, Qumran scholarship moved to a completely different uh, kind of uh, uh, discourse. Uh, but I would like uh, to mention, and this is my final uh, few slides, uh, that uh, even if we don't manage to combine these fragments and to, to reconstruct whole fragments, it doesn't mean that what we have is worthless. Quite the contrary. We can extract a lot of uh, interesting information even from fragments and small uh, fragments. And one uh, uh, of these, uh, uh, of these uh, uh, kinds of information uh, regards especially one of the sub-corpora of this uh, uh, collection, which is the, what we call the scriptural scrolls, the biblical scrolls. Because what we uh, discover more and more, is, and the more we study this topic, we realize how deep and pervasive it is. We realize that the biblical text that we tend to think about as a very fixed, due to its holiness, very fixed uh, kind of text, unalterable, actually in antiquity was quite the opposite. It appears that in, in our modern eyes, and this is already medieval, uh, because the text is, text is sacred, it should not be changed. For the ancient, it was the other logic completely. Because the text is sacred and our customs, religious customs, needs to, need to be anchored in the text, if the text doesn't say exactly what I need it to say, it simply needs to be improved. So the result is that every single manuscript of a biblical book looks quite different from every other uh, uh, exemplar. And uh, another project that I uh, conduct, again, is, is a kind of a sub-project within the bigger, dipper, uh, di the big uh, dip thing, is a, we, I create with a team of uh, graduate students a database which actually catalogs, identifies and catalogs each and every variant reading that we have in every fragment of these scriptural scrolls. And we devised a, a, a rather sophisticated uh, uh, method for analyzing and tagging these uh, variants so that eventually we can create a kind of a global, sorry, this would be a kind of big data thing, a global view of the types of changes uh, which can be correlated with every subcategory of these manuscripts according to age, kind, etc. Okay, so I think I'm overstepping basically my time. 
this is the last slide. Uh, this is another fragment which was published as a copy, the sole uh, remain from a copy of Isaiah. But again, even though it's a very small uh, piece, it's something of this size actually, uh, um, I think that if we pay enough attention uh, to the clues that the text uh, uh, betrays us, we can see that this was never part of any book of Isaiah, even if these are two verses are known from Isaiah. It's part from a completely different text. It's part from a prayer for the Sabbath. Okay, so I think this is, a, so even if it's a fragmentary thing, we can still know something about the history of Jewish prayer, even from such small uh, uh, stuff. So I, again, would like to thank you very much for your attention and patience. Thank you so much, Noam. This is uh, very exciting indeed. Uh, and, you know, new ideas and new insights by this kind of course disciplinary uh, uh, effort. Uh, a question or two to Noam. Ah, there are several. Okay. Yeah. Bible. I don't understand how you can make the statement that the Bible was always something that was looked at as you could change for your purposes when you're deducing it from a single sect that wasn't even a mainstream sect. It doesn't strike me as scientifically a valid uh, statement. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, I had to skip many, many uh, uh, crucial elements of uh, the information. Uh, I would say two things. First of all, um, it is uh, nowadays, I think, very widely assumed, and rightly so, by many scholars, that not all the scrolls that were found in Qumran were actually written or prepared by the very sectarian group that resided there. Many of these texts, actually at least 50% of that, had to be brought from the outside, had to be imported. We have certain stylistic and other and physical properties that suggest that. But also there is, a, I think, an element of common sense. Uh, this was a very relatively small group, and even if they resided there for two centuries, and they were there much less, I think, they couldn't produce such a huge amount of text. These, these are only the texts that we know. We know that there were other texts as well. So actually, even though we speak about an extreme condition in terms of the uh, finding, uh, um, actually this uh, corpus gives us a glimpse into a much broader spectrum of the textual variety that existed in antiquity. In addition, I have to say, that we have other external corroborations. We have, for instance, uh, translations made already in antiquity to uh, parts of the Bible or the whole Bible, most important of which is the uh, uh, translation to ancient, to classical, post-classical Greek, mm -hmm. known as the Septuagint. And many of the variants that we find there, we find the scrolls, find a match also in the Greek translation, and sh which is surely not a sectarian text. And it was probably prepared in Egypt. So we see that these uh, variants were diffused throughout uh, the textual reality, although Theoretically, of course, there might be some security. Okay, but what you're, uh, what you're bringing as a proof is something that we have um, statements in the Talmud that says the Septuagint was altered on purpose yeah. by the Hachami of that time. Yeah. So you're taking something that was put into Greek, knowingly altered for the benefit of the Egyptians, Greeks, mm -hmm. and yeah. then if it was retranslated back into Hebrew, mm -hmm. that two steps in which there could have been errors along the way? There were much, many more stages actually, uh, and again I skipped many of them, but I think I actually dispute the Talmudic uh, description of the history of the uh, 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 Septuagint, and uh, I only gave one example from the Septuagint, this is not the only one, there are other versions as well. So um, um, I still think that what we get is a, a glimpse into a much more varied Textual uh, uh, situation, which is, uh, by the way, uncomfortable for me, from a, uh, several perspective, modern perspectives. However, this is, uh, it appears more and more that this was the textual reality of antiquity. And, and the question is, how come? I mean, what, does, what is the historical significance of this uh, plurality as well? But that's, that's the biggest thing. I just have a, maybe a simple question. Have people looked at the um, orthography have yeah. done handwriting analysis basically I mean yeah. can you just not worry about what the words say but how they're written yes because they strike me as being really straight lines yeah. and kind of yeah. it kind of very stiff yeah. the way yeah. they're of done. course I was a, a little bit of cheating because I gave you the nice examples there are many uh, fragments that are 
almost illegible. Uh, but in general, I agree with you. This is, these are fine scribes, doing, uh, professional scribes doing excellent work. Uh, and a lot of the original sorting, as I mentioned, was done based on the different handwritings that we detect in the evidence. There are a couple of projects now running. Uh, um, the, the, our guys at the computer sciences do try to look into the handwriting as well. There is another project uh, being conducted at the moment at Groningen in, in the Netherlands, uh, which looks more specifically into handwriting and paleography. Uh, and we hope that in the end we will be able to identify this, the scribes. Uh, not by name, I mean, we can assign them our own names, but uh, at least to be able to know exactly individually who produced which uh, um, um, manuscript. Okay, I know I shouldn't, but I'll take two more questions. Yeah, one over there. Yeah. Bray Diel. Bray Diel. Bar is uh, a son, and Bray Diel is a, a syntactic construction. L is God. And Brady L is the son of God. No, El and El are actually, the, it's the same word in different uh, biforms. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, La one last question. Well, I can tell you a lot about results, but they, I won't be allowed to do that. Uh, but basically, I would say this, uh, based on the original sorting and reconstruction, because of course, we're not the first one to uh, try to reconstruct all these manuscripts. We're just trying, basically, we stand on the shoulders of giants and try to uh, 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 control some of their mistakes, but also move uh, the field forward. Uh, um, um, all these fragments were, are now published. This is a major accomplishment in itself. Uh, and uh, major chapters of uh, Jewish and Christian history have been rewritten the last, I would say, especially 40 years. Um, most importantly, I would say, um, so I move now to uh, the historical realm, I would say that uh, the idea uh, the f the fixed Judaism that we had prior to the discovery of the scrolls, as opposed to fixed Christianity, which evolved only according to the historical reconstructions in the second century, that is at least a generation after Christ, uh, all these uh, things that were held as, you know, as the truth uh, are no longer valid. We now realize that Second Temple Judaism was a much more plural uh, uh, social entity with many, many debates, much more debates than we anticipated on its self-definition, the place of different ideas within the ideological fabric of the uh, period. Uh, we realize now that nascent Christianity is much more Jewish than we realized before. We realize that many of the ideas that people, historians tended to ascribe to the second stage of Christianity, that is post-Christ, are actually rooted already in much earlier and pre Christ uh, era, so uh, um, and we realize more and more, as I said, that the uh, early Christianity was really a Jewish, not even sect at the beginning. It was one of the legitimate groups, one would say, of uh, uh, Jewish society of the time. There are also many small, uh, well, small, it depends on one's uh, perspective, of course. Uh, we, for instance, can now create a kind of a typology of script uh, from, uh, I would say, from the Persian period, from the four, fifth or fourth century, through the first or second century CE, which means that we can now much better date every new inscription and fragment which is being found. We can now place it because they have such a rich reservoir of texts that we can do that. And there are many other uh, respects as well. This is just you know, a hint, but I'll be happy to fill in the gaps later. Okay, thank you so much, Noah.